call the Justice Center Jail Project Committee to order this time. If there's anyone who wants to address the committee, we'll just go at this time. Okay. I talked to Jean Huntsman, and Joey just got out of surgery. She said the doctor said he was doing great. Keep Joey up there. Okay. My name is Gwen Holman. I live at 8150 West Park Drive. Um, this is for you, Mr. Horner. I'm asking you this. Nobody else, just you, because you're the chairman. Did the members of this committee meet privately one on one with Mosley Architects prior to the meeting? What are you asking? I'm asking you, did the members of this committee, the jail committee, meet with the uh, one on one with Mosley's architects prior to this meeting. We all do one on one. Okay, thank you. Did you meet privately with them, with Mr. Mosley? I, I mm -hmm. didn't. Well, for about a minute. Who set up the meetings? Do you know who set them up? The mayor's office. Okay. Why these private meetings? Why did you have to have these private meetings? Just one on one with the uh, architects. Okay. The Thank question you for is coming to us. Thank you for answering. Anyone else? Item 3A, uh, old business, so there's none. Item 4A, presentation design development phase. Mosley Architect, this time, the last time we come forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Dan Mace uh, with Mosley Architects. Uh, I do get called Dan Mosley every now and then, but Mr. Mosley passed away last year, so he was our founder of our company, but uh, our firm still carries his name. But uh, we have been uh, meeting with the commissioners one-on-one, uh, -on -one primarily to go through the updated design development documents in detail prior to this meeting. Uh, the design development phase is much farther advanced in the set of documents than the schematic design phase we presented to you back in February. And um, so what we're uh, presenting to you tonight is a kind of a, a snapshot view of a very thick set of documents that we unravel and share with you because there's a lot of engineering drawings, site development drawings, construction drawings, all that as a, as a means to inform you about the project and where we think the project is going forward. Um, so uh, with that, uh, where we are right now with the process, again, we're at the completion of the design development phase. We're asking the committee to recommend that our firm proceed with the uh, last design phase, which is called the construction document phase. This, act, this phase is where we'll take these developmental drawings which have been uh, uh, approved by the stakeholder groups, the court groups, all the folks have been working with to develop it this far, uh, to then turn it into the uh, documents that the contractor will bid for construction. Uh, at the completion of the con contract document phase, which would take us about four months uh, to complete, uh, we'll get state approvals in place, We'll meet back with you again for your approval for us to bid the project, advertise the project for, for bids for construction. Uh, that should be in the October time frame that we're looking at right now. We'll try to uh, uh, get that done earlier if we can uh, because I've got some information about costs I'll share with you later on in our presentation uh, that may be favorable for the county to, to do so in an expedited fashion. So um, after the... Um, after the advertisement phase in October, we're allocating about 60 days for the bidding process to occur. Uh, 30 days for, to advertise for general contractors, and 30 days once the contractors submit their bids for the county to issue contracts and give notice to proceed for construction. So everything going well, we should be turning dirt in early part of 2021. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to my associate, uh, Brian Payne, he's our project manager. <coughs> To go over with you and show you some uh, some images and some floor plans of where we are with the facility right now. Nice guy. Let's see if this works. Okay, good. So, 
So this is the site plan um, where we are to date with it. I will orient everybody on the pro uh, to the project. This is West Third North or Third North Street there. This is Jackson Street here. This is the new building, and this is the Helen Ross McNabb Center and the existing Justice Center here. Um, basically, folks will public uh, or staff would come to the building. They'd access the facility along uh, Jackson Street, and they'd come in an entrance here to the public parking lot and staff parking lot. Uh, detention staff and uh, arresting officers and things of that nature would come in off Jackson Street to what is currently an exit for Allison Street. And then they would wind their way up to the back secure perimeter of the building. Um, we've developed about 125 additional public, park, public staff parking areas in the front part of the building here. Um, and we've got a secure perimeter coming from the existing Justice Center over to the, to the new Justice Center, and a, a secure perimeter coming off the Justice Center in this area and adjoining the property line with Helen Ross McNabb and around back to the existing Justice Center. So we've developed some secure parking for judges in this area of the building. So they will be inside the secure perimeter fencing line of the facility. Uh, judges parking is kind of in that zone right there. The judges will come uh, entrance to the building, a uh, secure entrance to the building, covered entrance to the building, kind of in that zone there as well. All public entrance to the facility is in this spot right here. So there will be a staff entrance for uh, staff to the facility here. Uh, We've had some questions about expansion and in the future if there's ever a need to expand and build more detention housing if, if that need ever occurs in the future, which will probably hopefully happen long before any of us are, are you know, going here, that'll happen again. But the idea would be that the expansion would occur where the existing Justice Center is now. Um, folks in the Justice Center remaining would be the, the sheriff's staff, is uh, criminal investigation folks, um, patrol folks and the judicial services folks would be who is in there now. So obviously a phased approach for relocating those folks to build additional housing would have to occur at, at that time when, when and if that would ever occur. Okay. Floor plans of the facility. This is the lowest level of the facility. Um, this is, there'll be uh, detention housing over this area. This is an enclosed secure vehicle sally port where an arresting officer would come to, to bring their arrestee into the facility for the booking and intake, which occurs here in the blue that I'm showing. Uh, we've worked in a medical area here, kind of in light gray, if you will, uh, close proximity uh, to, the, to the booking and intake area. We've worked in the magistrate and a bail bondsman area. They have their own secure entrance to the facility here, so they're not, they don't come into the secure perimeter, but they do uh, have access into the facility. This is a loading dock area here. The semi trucks are would be able to back up to a loading dock there and offload um, bulky storage items directly into a storage facility here, or direct into the kitchen for food service supplies. Um, the cooler and freezers are located in this zone right here, so it's direct, uh, quick access to get stuff off the trailer and into the the cooler freezer or the dry goods storage area. So the brown area here is kitchen area. And this light brown here is laundry facility uh, for, for the facility. This is your core size and all this area here is sized for approximately 650 beds in the facility. Um, that could grow in the future up to maybe upwards of 700, maybe with a few swap out of pieces of equipment in the kitchen in the future if that need occurs. So when that expansion, if it's needed in the future to add additional beds, this facility should be able to grow with that need. Uh, we came to you guys in February and talked about um, the work release program and how we might work that into this area of the building here. Uh, we've done that. We've successfully worked in a 40-bed um, male work release facility that's isolated from the remainder of the building. There's an exterior entrance here so we can control those, those workers who may leave the facility to go do uh, clean up or other functions um, that they may uh, perform around the county. We've isolated so they can come and go uh, without cross-contamination into the remaining population of the facility. So that, that dormitory is isolated in the facility. Here are your, here are your uh, elevators in the facility there. 
um, inmates who may be housed on level one, two, or three of housing above but may have a court date would come down from housing in those elevators to this level. They would walk around the corridor here to, there's some court holding on this level and an elevator up to level one where there's a secure court holding between courtrooms that I'll share when we move up to level one. Moving up to level one, this, this is the floor just above what I showed you. The core area of kitchen and booking and intake is below this first floor of housing here. First floor, first floor of housing, second floor of housing, and third floor of housing are identical with one exception on level three, which I can go into detail as we move forward into this. But basically, the housing consists of two 39-bed pods here, two 39-bed pods, and two 19-bed pods here. Rough, rough number is housing about 200 per floor, rough number. There's some program space in this area, a couple of multi-purpose rooms, a medical area. The idea is that um, we can move nurses up from medical up to the housing floor and have a place for them to perform uh, medical needs on the housing floor and we don't move inmates down. We try to isolate and contain inmates on the floor that, that they're housed in. Uh, again, the elevators uh, to, to the move, movement is right here. Above the housing level, on each one of the floors, there's a mezzanine level that you see represented here. So you've got a run of uh, double occupancy cells here, and you've got a mezzanine just above all of those cells that you see here. So each one of these housing pods has a mezzanine level. Directly over the diamond salad port that you see going with access to each one of these housing pods is where your elevated con officer control room is. There's a stair off the main corridor here to access that uh, officer control room. There's a staff toilet inside the control room. Um, and these entire walls around that control room is glass. It's angled glass, so officers have good line of sight down into each one of the housing pods. There's also a countertop uh, for them to sit at for their uh, workstation access, which they can still see beyond the workstations into the housing units as well. Provides very good line of sight. All of those windows are angled uh, slightly into in bore into the uh, dorm or the, or the housing unit, and that's to give good line of sight so an officer can walk directly up and look straight down uh, so we don't have any blind spots. All of the facilities will be supplemented with cameras, so there will be camera views that they can see, but you, know, you can also physically view down into the housing uh, unit. Uh, we provide good line of sights through each one of the housing pods. Also on this floor level, this is your one-story uh, judicial center, your courthouse, your administrative spaces, um, things of that nature, uh, clerk of court. Uh, this is your main public entrance. Everyone coming to this facility who might be you know, part of the public, who might be coming to court, might be coming to do video visitation with one of the inmates, might be an attorney who comes to visit uh, with the inmate, maybe come in for an administrative visit uh, with staff, would come through this public entrance here. Um, the lobby is sized that we can have a security control station and we can screen everyone coming through uh, with magnetometers and x-rays so we prevent um, contraband coming into the facility. It's one way in around the security desk and one way out that's controlled flow both with security control on the entrance and then turnstiles on the exit. What you see there in the green, the corridor that leads vertical on the plan here is the public uh, zone of the building. The public can come in from the front entrance of the building. They can access video visitation here. If they need to visit with jail administration, that's what you see in blue here. There are public toilets right in this area. And attorneys could come around the corner here to uh, uh, visitation rooms with their clients if they're, in, if they're inmates in this house in this facility. Public can also come down the main corridor here with access on the right hand side to the clerk of court area. The whole bar in brown along this right hand side here is the clerk of court zone. We've, we've worked with the clerk and the clerk staff on breaking up that area into three distinct zones. There's three, three distinct groups under her umbrella and they have each got their own zone within the facility there. As a, pub, as a member of the public comes down and they maybe need to visit one of the courts, we've got three courtrooms here. This lowest courtroom that you see here is the juvenile courtroom. 
Um, seating in that area is the capacity in the public area is roughly 145, 146 individuals uh, for juvenile there. The second courtroom that you see here is the general sessions courtroom. Seating in that is about 116, 118, something like that. And then the north mo planned northmost uh, courtroom is the criminal court, and that's the jury courtroom. That courtroom capacity is roughly 160. Um, like I said, that is the jury courtroom. We've got a jury box. The jury can be dismissed to deliberation directly across the hall in that area there. Um, we do have this inmate um, holding area between the two courtrooms. Access to this is from below, of an elevator access up into this secure holding. So, and, and then this back quarter here, behind the courtrooms, is judicial access quarter. Uh, quarter. I shared with you guys before, a facility like this, we want three distinct line paths of travel where we're separating public travel, we're separating judicial travel, and we're separating inmate travel. That's the ideal movement, so we're not cross-mixing those three populations within a facility like this. So the right-hand bar here is the public quarter, this back quarter is judicial quarter, and then down elevator over and up an elevator into this is the end. <coughs> so they're all distinct and secure from one another. Okay. And then back of house here in pink is the judicial office areas here. They have an entrance in this area with access up to this level from parking below in this zone. Okay. Moving on to level two, the level two of housing is identical to level one before. Still, still 39 bed pods here and here, 19 bed uh, pods here, mezzanine and control room above it. And then level three, um, the same thing is identical except that we've got dormitories on this end of the building. This, this, this level is meant to house females and to isolate females, separate female population from male population, and we're going to house them on the upper floor. And we can, we can um, staff and maintain female populations for minimum and medium security custody in a dormitory style, a little, a little bit better than you can male populations typically. But other than that, the floor plate is the same, the mezzanine um, level is the same, and the control room is the same. Uh, as they were below. And then we've got a few renderings of what the building uh, would look like. This is an exterior shot looking at the public entrance here. Um, so again, all public would come to this entrance here. And then this is the, uh, the detention center, the multi-story detention center behind it. Um, what we've tried to do is um, um, be respectful of our surrounding community and um, maybe uh, give this building a little bit more public presence, a little bit more civic dignity, uh, so that we've got, we're flagging this entrance so that folks know coming to this, this is a public entrance, this is a public building, and folks are welcome to that. Like I said before, when you come in through this, this building, or these doors, that's when you're in that public lobby that I shared with you earlier, if you remember. Also, we've tried to pay attention to the large detention center that you see here, and I think this next folk, uh, picture here would do, do a, a service. It's a large building, and we want to make sure that it fits within its surrounding area and that it's not just a big blank wall, big prison look to it. So we've, we've tried to, um, with materials only, um, look at some finished, exterior fenestration to kind of break up those big blank walls. And so they give some visual interest. It's not just a big uh, blank space. Um, that, so it doesn't have that prison feel, uh, if you will. And then here's an interior rendering of what that public lobby would look like. We've raised this. This is a large volume. There's a lot of people coming and going. Uh, so there's, there's going to be quite a bit of people in this space. Uh, and so we popped up the ceiling a little bit and captured some high windows to bring in a lot of natural daylight. And uh, as you can see, there's a officer control station in, in the entrance here, the pub, the front entrance is on the left hand side there so folks would come in and they could, would come through the x-ray machines and magnetometers here before they're directed elsewhere in the building. Uh, they could access courtrooms beyond video visitation along this side, detention administration on that area as well. So again, it's a lot, it's a, it's a large space, there's a lot of coming and going so there'll be a lot of people in there so we needed to size it properly to, to handle that volume. Uh, folks coming through. So, um, I think that's it. We have some questions. Um, and we can 
address or anything I can flip back to you so show you. Yeah, Brian, uh, yes, sir. I, got, I got a couple. Uh, I found out yesterday that uh, I didn't know this, that uh, Esco Johnny, our sheriff, is not going to be in the new detention center. He's going to be over where he's at now. Correct. His, his administrative staff, uh, the criminal investigations, and patrol would remain in the Justice Center as, as long as well as the uh, juvenile services folks. Detectives and everything. Is there any way you could make a breezeway or something where he could come from there without having to go down the sidewalk and come back up to the room? Well, there is a rear connection that they, if staff needs to come to the detention center from there, they could still come in an exterior door uh, from there. Uh, so they, you know, obviously master control would have to allow them in, but that, that is functionally possible. Okay, next question. How many elevators in this building? There are four. Four. Yes, sir. I talked to Dan a few minutes ago. I think you have done a fantastic job of putting this together. You worked on it a long time. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, just, I, want, I want to thank you. For, uh, I, I enjoyed looking at it because I didn't know what it was going to look like. And on the design stage, you don't know. But. Well, I hope we've um, conveyed to you guys um, what the concept is, what what you're getting. Um, we you know we want to make sure that you guys understand what the county's getting. Uh, so that's been that's been the point of uh, coming up here this week. Anything else I can answer or address? I'll turn it over to Dan. It's a Dan. <laughs> I'm six feet behind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't. Um, one of the things I alluded to you earlier is, you know, obviously there's some things, you know, as you go to bids uh, and what we'll deliver at the end of the con contract uh, document phase will be a detailed cost estimate uh, performed by our independent, <coughs> excuse me, independent uh, cost estimator that we have on, online for the project. Uh, what we have seen though, and I'll share with you now, uh, is some, there's a, a little bit of silver lining in the COVID thing. And what that's done is thrown the building economy into somewhat of a recession. Uh, we have bid two similar projects during this COVID uh, scenario we're dealing with right now. One of which was in early March for a replacement courthouse facility uh, uh, that we took bids on. Uh, st you know, specifically just a courthouse, uh, replacement courthouse. That project uh, had a lot of contractor participation, good contractor participation, and came in at roughly $264 a square foot, uh, which was several million dollars underneath where we thought the project would be. Well, this, everybody was happy. Uh, I, I kind of checked the box in my mind to say, I wonder if COVID might have something to do with this. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, we took bids on a standalone jail facility of similar size to what we're talking about here, a little bit less, about 100 beds less. And uh, that project is actually located in the uh, economic area and environment of, of Wake County, which is Raleigh, Raleigh-Durham area. Now, normally we see construction prices higher than we might find in a more rural county, as, as expected, because the amount of construction activity, the, everything going on in a, in a metropolitan area, costs are typically higher per square foot. Uh, we actually uh, bid this job, again with great contractor participation, and it came in $12 million under our estimate. It just astounding to everybody. Um, it was $312 a square foot, was it top? $312 a square foot. So that told me officially, <laughs> and gave me a lot of comfort that we are in a very good time to put this project into the marketplace. Probably the best we'll ever see. We're dealing with seven, eight-year-old prices right now in the marketplace we haven't seen since the last recession. I think that's what's happened. And, um, and so I do uh, anticipate, nobody knows the future for sure, but our effort is to get this ready to advertise and put in the construction market as quickly as we can to take advantage of that. So the numbers that we shared with you in, in February for the SD phase, since that time, as Brian illustrated, we've added that work, uh, work area, which has added scope, some scope to the project to get that work uh, farm, 40-bed uh, housing. Uh, so that's in addition to what we shared with you and the prices that we shared with you in February. However, given what we're seeing right now, I think we've got, still got more than generous of a budget to actually accommodate that without increasing the price. So, um, 
that's, that's some good news and what's been a pretty bleak time. So um, I just want to share that with you. Uh, another thing I think of interest to you and, and, the, uh, and the commissioners as a whole is a, quali a quality. I know you've entertained a construction manager type uh, uh, extra set of eyes on the project. Um, and and what, um, what I want to share with you are some of the measures that we are doing and some of the measures I might recommend the county entertain in order to attain what you're looking for is a good quality project getting built what you paid for. Uh, one of the things is what we do in-house that I'll, I'll, I'll share with you is what we call our ready check process. Um, ready check was actually, we didn't invent that name, it's R-E-D-I, it was invented by the Navy, U.S. Navy, for their quali uh, quality control for their projects. So we saw a good idea so we just copied it. So that's what, <clears throat> that's what we do and what that entails is uh, at the completion or near completion of our drawings when we're sending them off for state, local and, uh, review uh, and approval of the project is we send them to a third party in our office, that's what they do, uh, and we schedule a time. They spend a number of weeks pouring through the drawings and identifying either conflict, errors, or anything they can see, flag, things that might confuse a, a contractor. Um, no matter how hard we try, there's no perfect set of drawings. But I always think the more educated set of eyes on a project, the better off your project's going to be. So they look at it completely cold and go through it, all the engineering drawings, everything in there, all the specifications. And then they, we meet back with them as a group and go through it and, 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 and implement those, those things learned um, to improve your quality control in your project. The other thing you may want to consider uh, that we do by mandate in the state of Virginia uh, for all of their capital projects is an independent value engineering firm come in and review our drawings in the same manner. Now what they're looking for is not necessarily what we look for. We look for uh, clarity of documents and you know, conflict and that sort of thing. What they look for is value engineering, what they call value engineering items. Items in the project that for some reason may save money. Uh, some of them may affect quality or life cycle. But we want them to come up with a comprehensive list of things that we would consider as a group. We meet with them after they go through the drawings and have a full day, day or two meeting with them because it's typically a, a detailed, uh, long meeting. And, um, and go through and they offer up suggestions. It may be an example, typically the first one is, let's put a, a less expensive roof on the building. Okay. Well, there are less expensive roofs than what we recommend. We we'll recommend a top quality roof. Um, so yeah, that costs more than a cheap roof, but I, I want them to list it and let's talk about the life cycle, you know, implications of that. So we can decide yes, no, maybe, and then uh, from, from that whole exercise, we might have a, a list of a number of items that might further reduce the cost of the project when you bid it. Again, it's in the effort to improve the overall quality and make sure we hit it one more time of why we chose the systems that we do to make sure it's a it's in the best interest of the county long term uh, to, to, for your building. Uh, so we do su suggest you might want to consider that. Uh, there's some firms out there that perform that service and we'll be glad to work with them should you decide to do that. Uh, the other thing, the third thing I, th I think I want to make you aware of that ties into your construction management thing is the reason you were looking into that was to have, again, uh, somebody out on the job given the size and complexity of the project to have every day during a whole course of construction, for con the construction to the administration of the construction contract. Uh, what I recommend and what we're doing with a lot of counties, in fact, we're doing with the, the, the jail project, I just uh, let you know about the bids in, in, in uh, Johnston County, is to um, hire, hopefully, maybe someone, a local uh, resident that's a retired job site contractor superintendent that may have kids and grandkids that go to school here, that has a vested interest in the county, uh, that would be an ideal candidate. Um, and, and they would come in as an independent contractor. Uh, we can run them through our contract if you'd like. But they really are, are in the sole position and their sole uh, priority is to observe, monitor, and document the construction process daily to advise the architect of anything they see that's out of line with the contract documents, serve as your another set of eyes, educated eyes on the project, and to really have Hamlin County's sole interest 
as, as part of their job description. Um, that you'll find that that it, uh, I think there's you might have that hail property that uh, may be at serve as a good place for them rather than a trailer on the job site uh, to house that person. They they might need a part time administration person to help them with the paperwork because there is a lot of paperwork that goes back and forth. I would want that person to also review the shop drawings that we're reviewing during the course of construction and and comment on those. And so again, I think the whole idea is. Uh, you, you hire a good architect engineer, you hire a, a, the most uh, qualified contractor for the least price, and you have an extra set of eyes on your job during the course of construction to make sure it's staffed properly with subcontractors and such. So you end up, the, the project getting, is getting completed on time, and you're getting the quality of a project that you deserve. So I hope that wasn't too winded and too quick, but uh, I think that's something you, uh, that I would recommend you consider. For this project. Um, the, the project type of advertising when we get to ready for bids and you approve us to bid the project, we recommend you go through what we call a contractor pre-qualification process. Now what this does is there's two ways, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a way that the, con the, the, the county would advertise for qualified contractors to build this particular project. I think it's important that you know, and it's, it should be in your interest not to have a contractor trying to build their first jail project on your dock or, or a complex project. Um, what this will do is you would advertise globally for con interested contractors. They would respond to it. You would check references, check past projects. Uh, from that uh, list of respondents, you would shortlist that into a group that would formally bid the project. It might be five to six out of the 10 to 15 that you would get interest on. Um, that were qualified and had, you know, maybe it's more, depending on what you get. But from that list, you are then honed it down to reputable contractors with long-term success, that are bondable, biddable, that get quality subcontractors to bid your project, and they would competitively bid the project. That's, that's how I would recommend you deliver this uh, for the king. So I didn't know if you had any questions about any of that. Or uh, on your square footage, do you have a breakdown of how much of it was Jesse Center and how much of it was Dale? In our schematic design estimate, no. I mean, when we do it, our takeoff of this is for the building as a whole. You know, given if we got the similar price, you know, the courthouse that we bid in March is specifically a courthouse. That costs less per square foot than does a detention center. The detention center is the highest for all That's the security right. and everything in there. Uh, and so, the 264 to 3, um, 3, 4, 312 range, you would find yourself somewhere in between there. I think it would be closer toward the 312 range because we have, square footage wise, more jail than we have court space in this particular project. But it wouldn't be, it, th this would be less than that, all things apples being apples. You know? I'm sorry, you know the total square footage then? How much are we looking at those? Of, of, of the entire place. 196,000 196, square feet here. So I know everybody's calculating. But uh, uh, again, we'll see where we are. We're, we've, we'll actually be bidding the project with four to six months future time. So I'm, I'm giving you where we are right now, which is a very good time to, to bid a project. I wish we had it ready to bid right now. I wish I could do that. You know, we've got to invest the time to get it done. Dan, you, asked, you were talking about like project manager that would be working with you, going over your designs, looking at blueprints. Mm -hmm. yes, what sir. was that? What would you call him? Yeah, he's, he's, our, he's a representative. He, he's one of my employees with my firm. and He's a quality control uh, architect, and we've got engineers that do the same. And their responsibility, all they do every day, the only thing they do every day is check all of our projects, all of our corporate projects that come to them, they do the same thing on them. And they take the drawings apart. They're, they're red pen guys. All they do is mark it up. Uh, I don't like the look of red ink on the drawing. It's like something a teacher gave me in grade school. I never like to see it, but for us, it helps improve your quality of your project. So they're looking for any errors, anything that they question, they'll mark it up. And, uh, and they is invest a lot of time in it. Is that a separate contract? Yes, sir. Is that a separate contract? No, that's just part of our basic services. We just we just do that. Most architects don't do that, but that we, we do. Sir, is that our freebie for the day? 
Well, that's, I wouldn't say free. We included it in your fee to start with, but uh, you know, I anticipated the time and hours they would do for the project of this magnitude in, in when I negotiated the fee with them. So it was really what they do, they, they check y'all out. They that's right. That's right. Uh, again, rather than just, uh, Brian's a very competent architect, and our team are very competent engineers. Uh, but once you look, one person looking at something for so long, you can develop errors that somebody else will see. So we found that adding that extra level of observation and, and, and critique on a project helps the set of drawings improve. So. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move that we accept this design phase and authorize our architects to proceed with the construction development phase. Second that motion. I got a question. I, I, talk, I talked to Esco today, and he got the count from half the staffing count from Jim Hart, and the staffing count is one a minimum of 128. That's it. Forty thousand is five point one million dollars a year for staff. Does that include <clears throat> our person? Well, the one end of the building, the other end. That's not just guard. That's that's because right now fun. he's right now. He told me that he had fifty three. Right. 30, 53 people. With well, this 128, it's going to have to be 75 more people. Uh, I'm just going to say, you understand what I'm saying? Is that, is that 128, is that cooked, cleaners? Oh, no, that's, that's not everything. That's just correctional staff. Jim Hart is the one who gave it to him. He's the one who gave it to him. We're assuming that that staff is for a facility that's completely full. I figured Jim Hart would give us a breakdown of what it's for. We get to get that. That's what's seven hundred inmates, six hundred inmates. What? That would be probably with six hundred inmates. Full staff. Full jail. Jeff, for these mics on I'm having difficulty hearing Uh well you all control your own. that you gave us. I know there was some talk, um, some questions, you know, the old proverbial hand garden or box garden to hen house thing. But you did say that they were third party too, even though they were do we need to make in several years. But I do appreciate the other options that you gave us. Well, thank you. Thank you. 
again, you know, you don't have to proceed with any of those options. Uh, you know, we, we've had successful projects either way, but I think to the extent, given the complexity of this project, I think you would benefit from those additional observation elements of the process. And just to add to Commissioner Neesmith, you know, he said he appreciated getting to see the design, which is why we decided that these commissioners should see it one-on-one -on -one with you guys. So I appreciate that. Thank you. This instruction manager that we talked about, what would be his qualifications? Are there any hard and fast rules? Um, I, I would say for the, this retired job site superintendent, they would have to have uh, a, a number of years working in construction, preferably as a project manager or project superintendent for, for construction. And it doesn't have to be a jail project. It just needs to be a project of some level of complexity. It might be a large scale commercial building or, or a medical building, anything like that. Uh, our construction administrators that, that you're getting with us also are, are very much uh, trained on this type of building. So what we would suggest is if you're going to retain somebody like that, you do so in the next couple of few months. So that person can be brought on board. We can open the plans with them and have a detailed meeting, meet with our construction contract administrators, and go over things like we, that we demand in the job. You know, I, I was using an example earlier of how we specify construction of detention grade concrete block walls, where we, have a, we require a, a, every four feet we have to come out and inspect the project to make sure the reinforcing steel is down and they can't con pour because all those cavity walls are in, the, in the concrete block are poured solid with gravel. Uh, we have to inspect that to make sure the openings are clear, the re reinforcing steel goes all the way down like, like per our drawings before they're allowed to pour it. Otherwise we make them tear it out uh, because we don't know what's there. And so an individual like that would need to know about these things and the nuances to this type of construction. So we recommend bringing those folks on board prior to the construction occurring so they can become completely familiar with the documents while we have things the way we have them. And so they're not hitting the ground first cold like a contractor does when it's under construction. Dave, did you uh, confirm that that's what you're calling the project manager of someone possibly a local that can be on site daily. Right. A con yeah, your construction, some people call that a clerk of the works. Um, there's any numbers of, of, but a construction administrator or county, uh, a county construction advisor, however you want to call that. We are your construction contract administrator. In other words, our job when it goes into construction, and we're legally bound to this, is to become an, an equal arbiter to, uh, to observe to the best of our ability uh, in, on, on our site visits that the project is being completed in accordance with the contract documents. The contract documents themselves that we're now, you know, would now prepare is a legal document and we would be, in a way, the arbiter of that legal document discerning in your interest and in the contractor's interest what is intended in those documents. You follow me? So uh, this person is, his responsibility would be out there every day where we're coming, you know, once a week or something like that. He's out there every day. Um, and his job is to observe, monitor, document. He lists how much staff. I mean, one of the things we've seen happen on some jobs, when the contractors get busy, it may be a subcontractor. They may not have enough staff on that job. They may push them to another job. If that, your representative out there would monitor that and say, something's going on here. We lost half the electrical subs. Where are they? You know, and that way we can flag these things early on, run to them and say, what's going on? That way we don't, we don't get, um, you know, delays that occur due to that that could have been nipped in the bud. Or, so that, that's, I think, the advantage of having that full-time supervision aspect of it. So some people call that a clerk of the works. It's kind of what that is. He's got mixed up between uh, construction manager, project manager, you know, the difference in, in that. Right. A construction management firm might be managing multiple subcontractor bids and holding those bids. Uh, they kind of perform like a con general contractor would, perhaps. Uh, and a construction manager agent is kind of doing just that. Um, and they're firms that, they're large firms that, that do that. And I think you've solicited bids and you've seen some of those prices for that. That's why I'm recommending a local retired individual, same experience, 
but you know you hire them as an independent contractor. You're not paying for that high overhead with those companies. So no professional licenses will be required. None, none. They're there to observe, monitor, and document. They relay things to us. We 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 do not absolve ourselves of our legal responsibilities. It doesn't take the place of that at all. It's just an extra set of educated eyes on the job. Watching what's going on. Yeah, there are a bunch of farmers know what that guy's doing. <laughs> right close. Well, I mean, I think like any job posting, you would interview those candidates that you're considering and, and ask about their experience in construction and uh, find one that is the best fit for you. Uh, we as a firm can provide you that same full-time site supervision if you want. Um, we can do that too, but I think option A would be what I recommended to you. If you can find that person, that would be the best bet and, and at the lowest cost. You do have to fix your $60,000 It might be more because I'm going to have to ship somebody that would live here for two years in a hotel and you know, be in a trailer and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, that would be substantially more than, I think, hiring a local. I think you'd get a better job out of it than that. Well, it costs, you wouldn't get a better job, but you'd, get a, you'd save a lot of money. What would be a fire price for a person like that? I don't know for sure. It depends on the individual, but somewhere in the 75000 a year range uh, would be my guess. It's what we normally see for two years. It, it's about a two-year construction project, so that's kind of the duration. If you hire them a couple of months ahead of time, it might be a total of a two year and a half years that you'd be paying that. We'll be happy to, you know, if you do decide to go that route, if you've got some resumes, we'd be happy to have our construction guys look over their resumes and make their observations as well and give our opinion on it. But, um, it's really ultimately your decision. And you can, you can hire that person directly, the county. If you'd like, you can run it through our contract. That's, 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 it's available, we've done that a lot, but it doesn't have to. It can run through the county as well. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, thank y'all. Thank you, Chip. We'll move on to uh, 4B, construction oversight. We he just pretty much. Yeah, he's covered all that. If, if you, I mean, what I see, the next step would be in that area is that we prepare an RFQ for uh, a request for qualifications for that position if you want to go in that direction. And uh, we can go ahead and prepare that and bring it to you and then you can decide whether that's the way you want to go. Any
Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> Probably because they said a local person. How do we give a big rat's pet about that? Do you? I will tell you, I have mixed feelings on that one. Yeah, me too. Well, I mean, I have now mixed feelings. Yeah, but 